I wonder if anybody here has ever traveled to Europe and seen some of the great cathedrals of Europe. Have you had that opportunity before? Uh, amazing buildings. But you know, one thing you realize as you go through those amazing bu- flying buttresses and you know all the all the I love all that stuff. But but one thing that grieves me about it is they're empty. Europe used to be a, a great center of missionary sending and Christian faith and. Uh, and, and now those secularity has taken over, it seems like, in, in Europe. And that's not the only shift to have happened. I mean, uh, even in the New Testament, the, the Christian centers were Antioch and Ephesus and some of the places and, and some of those, have, have under, they're not major Christian centers uh, today. You know, uh, where the heart of Christianity is today is in the global south. In fact, Europe it used to be the great missionary sender is now uh, receiving missionaries from Asia and from Africa and from South America as the gospel seems to have shifted to the global south. And, you know, I've read books about why this shift. And uh, one author has put it this way, God goes where he's wanted. God goes where he's wanted. And where does that leave us in in America? You know, uh, a shift is happening, I believe, right now. A shift is happening right now. And, um, you know, I think it's been going on for uh, maybe a little while, but um, COVID has been an accelerator. I said that it was called in by a, a church uh, recently, a few miles from here, and they, they wanted to get my advice and counsel, and I was honored to go do that. But there's about 10 people in the room, and they said, uh, this is our whole church, basically, right, right here. Where, where did everybody go? They, they were in decline for a long time, but uh, now they've gone from decline to demise, and they don't know if they can keep up their building, if they can keep their, keep their doors open. And it's happening all around us, you know. Uh, when I moved to Geneseo back in 2009, people would tell me what a, what a church community. We've got so many strong churches, and, and, and that, was, that was true in a way. I said, boy, it's, it's, so the men all get together for Lenten breakfast, and there's over 100 there. And I said, boy, that's great. And I said, boy, these are, these are guys my age and older, though, you know. Where's the, where's the young guys at? And all of a sudden, a church that had 300 maybe has 75. A church that had 200, now they have 35. You know, that's the, that's the pattern. And, you know, uh, our church has weathered this whole thing better than any church I know about, to be honest with you. You have been amazingly faithful in your, and even those that couldn't be here in person, worshiping online, giving it actually went up last year instead of down last year because our, our folks uh, leaned in. I don't worry about our church. Here's what I worry about, uh, concerned about, I should say, is the mission field. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to be one to say we're the best church in town or we're the, we're the only place it can happen and, and that kind of thing. I, I wouldn't be that arrogant to say that. But here's one thing I do believe. I believe that First Methodist is better situated to lead a resurgence of Christian love, faith, and service in our area than any other church. I believe, I believe that we're better situated to, to do that. And that's really my heartbeat and my cry as we launch this new series called All In. Because, you know, it, it seems a little unfair that you have, you have been so faithful, you know, well... You know, you, you, you've seen us through this time, and, and I just thank you so much for that. But it's not about the survival of our church. It's really about the mission. You know, our church exists to draw people to Jesus, develop people in Jesus, and deploy people for Jesus. And, and I feel a greater burden for us to do it, because if we don't do it, I don't know who else will get it, well, is going to get it done. Okay, so I think this is a time for us to run for Jesus right now. I think this is a time for us to do ministry like we've never done it before. We need to get entrepreneurial. We need to think outside the box. We need to extend our mission. And we never see ourselves as a competitor with any other church. We are partners in the gospel with every other church. But I think there's a leadership role, right, that that we we can play. And so I'm going to I'm going to call you to that when as we talk about all in. And, you know, uh, here's the other thing I know is when people have been very pessimistic about the church, the, the obituary for the church of Jesus Christ has been written a million times. <laughs> I mean, a million times it's been, it's been written. We have buried more of our uh, obituary writers than, than you could imagine. 
And um, here's what Jesus said about this whole topic. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And he didn't promise to build our church. He promised to build his church. Our job is to be his church, right? And if we build his church, he's going to, to because the mission has never been greater. There has never been uh, more people that need Jesus within 15 miles of where I'm standing than ever before. Our church has existed since 1850, okay? And, uh, and you know, whenever, whenever Christian faith has kind of ebbed or waned, God has always sovereignly acted by the power of His Holy Spirit to bring revival and renewal and a, a resurgence of faith. You know, in, when America, around the time of the founding of America, uh, not everybody was sure that, you know, uh, Christian faith was going to, was going to survive. But in England, it was called the Evangelical Revival. In America, it was called the, the First Great Awakening. There was an out, absolute downpour of the Holy Spirit upon our nation. It really set the DNA for our nation in a lot of ways, that experience. And then on the American frontier, uh, people, a lot of people on the frontier didn't want to hear about Jesus. But let me tell you what, preachers got on horseback and, and faith communities sprang up. That's really where we were born as a church. Uh, a horseback preacher came and started to work in, in 171 years ago before Abraham Lincoln was president, okay? And started to work and God did amazing things. And I believe God wants to do it again in our day. But he needs some willing vessels. He needs some people that say, I'm, I'm all in. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we open the Word today. Lord God, we're so thankful that your, your Spirit speaks through your Word. Your Word's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It gives us everything we need to know to have a living, loving, lasting relationship with you. Uh, Lord, would you speak through your Spirit today? Would you anoint me to preach your Word with clarity and with unction and with power, that your, that your church may be edified, that we may be called to a next step with you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to be calling you to uh, All In. And All In on service. Two weeks, uh, we're going to have an event out in the commons called Get in the Game. It's, you're going to see a lot of our ministry leaders out there. They're going to be en enlisting you to, to help with some vital ministries that are going on. Uh, three weeks from today, that's our time to make our financial commitment to God's work in the coming year. I'm just going to boldly and without apology ask you to give like you've never given before because the, the needs of the mission have never been more urgent. And then um, today we're going to lay the foundation stone for all that is to come. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, our, our primary task as a church. Our primary task. Uh, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy and um, he said, uh, here's, I want to give you first things first. And here's what he said in, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2. He said, uh, first of all, first of all, I want prayers and petitions and intercession and thanksgiving to be made for all people. As you organize the church, as you lead the church, Timothy, here's, here's job number one. It's, it's not preaching. It's not singing. It's not build a building. The early church didn't know anything about buildings. They met at somebody's house. They met in the temple courts in Acts chapter 2. Long church met for a long time without any, without any buildings. It wasn't build a building. It was, first of all, I want you to pray. First of all, I want you to pray. And then he comes back and he says it again uh, a few verses later. He says, therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without, without anger or disputing. Uh, you know, the church was born in a prayer meeting. In Acts chapter 2, that's really the, was the birthday of the church. And it was, it was not a preaching session, it was a praying session. The 120 believers gathered together in the upper room. Prayer is our native breath. Prayer is the heartbeat of everything that we do as a church. Prayer is where it starts. Because without prayer, we get what we can do. And we can do some cool stuff. We can have some great music. We can have programs. We can even entertain people every once in a while. But with prayer, we get what God can do. And uh, our world needs that uh, so desperately. Our community needs that so desperately. My friend Roger Ross likes to say it this way. If you want to see God move in your world, in your family, in your lives, somebody's got to pray the price. Somebody's got to pray. You know, every, every eternal thing that we've been able to accomplish as a church has been wrought in prayer. And, uh, you know, we have a, a prayer culture in our church. And, I, you know, I don't take any credit for it as your pastor 
Um, it, it was here before I got here. Uh, when, when they described to me, I'd never really heard of Geneseo before, uh, no offense, but when, uh, when I was uh, called to serve here, I didn't know anything about Geneseo. Uh, somebody mentioned football. Um, and, uh, but when they described the church, they, they said, this is, it's a praying church. It's a praying church. And, uh, I, you know, there's, there's a prayer culture right now as we worship. we got a couple guys in that room right there. They're praying for us as, as we worship because that's the engine room, right? Uh, that's, you know, uh, we, we can do our thing, but we need God's blessing to come upon us. And I noticed that uh, I've seen it today already. Uh, as you walk around the commons, if, as people are just mingling around, you'll see little groups huddled up praying. That's who we are as a church, you know, because we believe if somebody shares a need, uh, we don't just uh, say, well, I'll pray for you later. Let, let's pray now. There's a prayer and agreement. There's power and agreement as we come together as part of our prayer culture as a church. And, and I do believe that if I today walked into the third grade Sunday school class and said, I need one of you kids to pray for me, I believe there would be a child step out and pray out loud and put their hand on my shoulder uh, if they could reach my or, or hand on my back and they couldn't reach my shoulder and they would pray out loud. That's our, that's our prayer culture. I see it at VBS. I see it at youth group. It, it's, just, it's just who we are. Let's not be a church that says, well, the pastor's the only one that can pray. Or, I tell you what, if, if you can't lead somebody in prayer, you're always going to be limited in your, um, in your usefulness in, in God's kingdom. And, I, and, I, and people tell me, well, I'm just getting so nervous I don't have the right words to say. And I say very lovingly, as your shepherd... Get over it as quick as you can. I know, you're not, I know you're not comfortable, but get over it. You don't have to say, you don't have to speak in perfect King James English. Just pour your heart out to God. It's so important that we be able to do that. I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. But here's something I, I know that we always have to do. We have to go back and reinforce our foundation over and over again. That's what I'm doing with you today. I'm saying let's, we've been a prayer uh, that's everything that's good has come through prayer, but, but we need to go all in on praying. Um, do you have a picture of Jesus in your house? Anywhere? Do you have a picture of Jesus? In, you know, there's some classics. There's Jesus knocking at the door, that comes from Revelation chapter 3. You've seen that picture of Jesus. Uh, there's Jesus holding a lamb. That's supposed to remind us, you know, that Jesus is our good shepherd, as it says in John's gospel. There's even a, a picture of Jesus drinking a cup of coffee out in the coffee bar. I'm not sure where that came from. I'm not sure what Bible verse that leads to. Hebrews, I guess. I don't know. Some, somewhere, uh, uh, somewhere along in there. <laughs> But I've never seen the picture of Jesus depicted in anybody's home, you know, just for inspiration uh, from Mark chapter 11. Here's what, here's what happened in Mark chapter 11. On reaching Jerusalem, by the way, this is the triumphal entry. Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow any merchandise through the, through the temple courts. What was going on here? Uh, you know, I think it shocked the disciples as much as it shocked him. It didn't seem to be a planned thing. Jesus goes in the temple and the big crowd's there. It's Passover week. All of a sudden, Jesus starts turning over tables and driving out the money changers. And there was all this commerce going on in God's house because it was Passover time. And, you know, um, you, uh, you had to sacrifice your lamb. And, and guess what? They had pre-certified spotless lambs. They're waiting for you. These, these have been previously inspected by the priests. You didn't have to bring it from Bethlehem. You didn't have to bring it from Nazareth. You just came and bought it right there where, and, and it could be sacrificed right there. But it was pre-certified, so it's going to cost you some money to get a pre-certified lamb, right? Or a dove. And then, uh, then you know, you, could, you need to pay your temple tithe and uh, your, your, your temple gift, but you couldn't pay it in Roman money. You had to change it uh, for temple money. And guess what the exchange rate was? That got, a little, that got a little wonky during Passover time. There was price gouging and all that going on. All this busyness with the commerce. Is Jesus anti-commerce? No, He's not. He's, just, he's not against uh, money. He's for something bigger than money money and commerce. And here's what he said. He quoted the scriptures. Is it not written, my house will be called what? 
a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a, a den of robbers. Jesus was dangerous at the was 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 uh, Jesus was uh, was uh, emotional and uh, angry at the fact that uh, that the primary task was being uh, replaced by by something else. My house is to be a house of prayer. And you, you've made it into something else. It's so easy to let the main thing not be the main thing anymore. And Jesus was calling them back to that. Now in the New Testament, we don't have, uh, this is not a temple. We don't call this building a temple. Uh, the temple was something very particular in the Old Testament, a place, the only place on earth where sacrifice could be offered. In the New Testament, we have a different understanding of temple. Uh, in fact, it says in 1 Corinthians that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit as the body of Christ. The people are the temple. And if uh, being a house of prayer was true for the Old Testament temple, how much more is being a place of prayer and a people of prayer part of our DNA as a church, we've got to, we need to be a place of prayer, a people of prayer. Always going back, calling upon the Lord. Because without prayer, we get what we can do. With prayer, we can get what God can do. Thanks be to God. So how do you, how do you uh, become a, a house of prayer in your own temple? And, and together, collectively as a church, how are we going to be the temple that God's created us to be? That place set apart for prayer. Well, first of all, Jesus shows us here in Mark chapter 11, there has to be a clean sweep. Other things have crept in that have replaced uh, prayer. Uh, starting tonight, you, you've noticed uh, we've been doing this over the past, uh, uh, over a year now, I think. Uh, four times a year, we set aside a day for prayer and fasting as a church. And today is that day, by the way. 7 p.m. tonight to 7 p.m. Monday night, as your pastor, I'm asking you to deny yourself. Those of you that can completely fast, do that. Those of you that, for health reasons, cannot do a complete fast, do some sort of partial fast. But for 24 hours, let's set aside time to, to pray and fast and to uh, give God priority. You know, fasting eliminates the clutter and the other stuff from our life. It, it refocuses us. Uh, refocuses us on, on, on the Lord. And that's exactly uh, what I'm asking you to do uh, today, 24 hours. And by the way, we're going to conclude this with a prayer and pray service tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Come on out right here in the sanctuary. And you know what? There's nobody leading the service except the Holy Spirit. We're going to just going to pray and we're going to sing God's praises and we're going to conclude our time of prayer and fasting. And we're going to tell God, God, I'm all in. On, on prayer. Renew our heart for prayer, O oh God. Our, really, our focus is for this 24 hours of prayer and fasting is make us a house of prayer. Make us a house of prayer for all people, God. Let's be a church of prayer. Let's pray. Prayer be our native breath. So we need to ask for a, a clean sweep. You know, why do we get discouraged in prayer? Well, a few reasons. Maybe you don't believe it does any good, but we have the words of of Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter 7. He says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. And it's keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And Jesus says, Everyone who asks receives. Now you may not get exactly what you ask for, but what Jesus is saying here is that He is going to start the, 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 the blessings of heaven flowing in your direction when you pray. He knows what you need better than you know what you need. But he, in, he, his ordained prayer is the means by which he works in this world. Some people have asked, well, if God knows what I need anyway, why, do, why pray? You know, why don't I just kind of trust him and why do I have to, to ask for anything? Well, that's how God's blessings come into the world. God in his sovereignty has ordained that, he, that prayer be the means through which he works in our world. And so Jesus says, ask. He says, knock. He says, he says seek. And God's going to do his part. He's going to be faithful. And uh, he goes on to say, God knows how to give good gifts to his children. If your child asks for a, a, a piece of bread, are you going to give him a stone? No, you wouldn't. Do it. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does your heavenly father know how to respond to the requests of his children? Maybe you're weary and discouraged in prayer. You know, Jesus knew this was going to happen because Luke tells us in uh, Luke chapter 18, he says, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. I think Jesus knew that we'd be sometimes tempted to give up in prayer, that we'd be discouraged in, in prayer. And so he told them the story. You know the story he told them? It was about a little widow woman. And she, uh, 
uh, needed justice. And the only person that could give her justice was this judge, and the judge was a wicked man. He didn't respect people. He didn't honor God. He didn't care about anybody but himself. And this widow kept coming, getting up early in the morning, going to see the judge, demanding justice, demanding justice, demanding justice. And he said, finally, that judge says, I don't fear God or respect human beings. I don't care about justice. I don't care about anybody but myself. But I'm going to give this woman what she wants so she'll stop wearing me out with her coming. And, and Jesus' point was not that uh, God really doesn't want to bless you, but if you keep bugging Him enough, maybe He will. Jesus' point was if this unjust judge will respond to the cries of this widow that He had no relationship with, no honor for, no regard for, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those that cry out to Him night and day? Don't be discouraged in prayer. Keep on praying. Keep on inviting God. You know, I, I, um, I think sometimes in the church, we're, we're kind of guilty of praying mealy-mouthed little prayers that are all center around our safety. Okay, we, prayers like uh, we just want an insurance policy, we want to cover all the kids in prayer. You know, and that's good. Like homecoming was last night, we prayed last night. Lord, keep them safe, help them make good decisions out there with whatever they're doing. It's okay to pray for safety. But, um, you know, I think biblical prayers are kind of dangerous prayers, right? The, the Lord's Prayer calls us to God's kingdom and power and glory. Uh, before anything else. It's not just, Lord, don't let anything hurt me. It's, Lord, let me be dangerous for your kingdom. You know, I hope you're the kind of uh, Christian that when you wake up in the morning, Satan says, oh crud, they're awake. I hope we're the kind of church when I give the benediction, Satan says, oh no, here they come. Right? Because, uh, because the, uh, you know, Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I think the gates of hell should shake a little bit when, when they see us coming. Um, maybe you're distracted by prayer. You know, there's a lot of folks we're seeing fall out of church, getting out of the habit. You know, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. Have you noticed that, uh, that uh, your closet space at home, uh, things fill up, you know, just naturally because closets abhor a vacuum. So, you know, they just naturally fill up. At my table, a horizontal surface that's, that's clean, it has nothing on it. It seems like it collects stuff. You know, things just kind of gravitate. People just lay stuff down there. It just, it just builds up. And some people's calendars have got, they got out of the habit of church. And so their lives have filled up with so many other stuff. And, and so, you know, it gets to be, well, you know, I may go to church if there's nothing going on in the ball field, if there's nothing going on in the shopping, in, in, you know, or if they're here, there, and yonder. We've got to eliminate distractions. We've got to make a place for, for prayer and for worship as, as, a, as a centerpiece of our life. Otherwise, we'll get distracted. Sometimes our broken relationships keep us from prayer. Peter said, uh, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Uh, live with honor uh, so that your, your prayers may not be hindered. And James tells us something about prayer too, a barrier to prayer. Uh, when he says in James 4.3, when you ask, don't, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Pray kingdom-focused prayers, not just me prayers. Pray that God's kingdom would come. That God, God's, God's will would be, would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So make a clean sweep and then make a fresh start. You've got to begin again with prayer. You, get, you, know, you know what it takes to pray? You need a time, you need a place. Everything that's important to your life, pretty much, I, I bet you have it on your iPhone. It reminds you. You have, a, you have an appointment with God on your, on your calendar. And it's easy to let those slip. Re recommit to prayer. Uh, you know, a few uh, months ago, we started as a church praying the Lord's Prayer at noon. And I hope, I won't ask for a show of hands. I hope you're praying the Lord's Prayer with me at noon. But, you know, I, I confess that I, somehow my alarm got turned off and it was the easiest thing to forget, you know, when the, when the alarm doesn't go off at noon. You know, so a couple months ago, I, I had to do, do it again. I had to, I'm going to reset my phone at noon. I'm going to re-up. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer at noon. And God's been working through that. On Friday, I was driving home from a meeting in Indianapolis and I had two noons. Coming back, because uh, Indiana does things a little differently with their time zones and everything. And, and so I, my, my alarm went off twice, and I got to say the Lord's Prayer twice that day. 
And uh, I've had a lot of people tell me, Joe, you've shared with me, you've had a lot of cool encounters with people when you just say, hey, my alarm just went off to pray the Lord's Prayer. Would you pray that, would you pray that with me? There's a lot of great things that come from praying the Lord's Prayer at noon. So you've got you to re-up. Um, so so make, a, make a fresh start. And the third thing is accept humble beginnings. You know, don't say, okay, well, Pastor Chris preached on prayer, so I'm going to try to pray for two hours today. That's not the point. It's, it's build a little habit into your life. It's a cumulative effect. So the, the goal is not to, to just pray. The goal is to have your, a 24-7 relationship with God where the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and guiding your steps. That's the big picture. But the prayer time, the, the time you set aside for prayer, is a time to refocus and reorient yourself around the Lord's presence in your life. And so don't be ashamed of small beginnings here. Just set a little, I'm going to pray for five minutes in the morning. And maybe as a family, you've let go of the idea of a family altar or praying together as a family. Just, just, just a doggedly reclaim mealtime prayer. Okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna pray before we we're gonna pray before we eat. Bedtime prayer. I, I tell you what, one thing Becky and I used to do for our kids: we sent them out the door for the school. We always said pause. We put our hands on their heads. And we blessed them for the day, and it was an anchor point to remind them of who they were, to remind them, to remind them of that, that we're, looking, we're out there in the world under God's blessing and protection. Bless your children. Uh, pray together as a couple. Uh, some, some couples uh, get the upper room that are out there, and they drink their coffee together, and they read the upper room together, and, and they pray together, and it's a little anchor point, okay? Create those little anchor points through your day. Just little incremental things, little new habits. Uh, set some alarms. Get some structure. And if you miss a day, don't beat yourself up because so many people have kind of a picture of a, of a punitive God who's, you missed yesterday, so now I'm a, you can come, but I'm going to pout and scowl at you for, for the next three weeks. That's not the heart of our Heavenly Father. Jesus gives us the, the picture of God in, uh, in Luke chapter 15 where, where He runs to His Son. He falls on His neck. He kisses Him. And, and, and don't think you're going to have to kind of... Uh, be in, the, be in the penalty box for six weeks until you get your act straight. God just wants you to come. God just wants you to pray. And even if it's been a very, very long time since you tried, now's the time to try again. And as a church, it's time to relight the fires. To, to, to build a, a house of prayer. Jesus didn't say, my house will be a house of preaching. He didn't say, my house will be a house of singing. He said, first and foremost, my house will be a house of prayer.